about professional quality audio and how to make your live stream a little bit better by upping your audio game. So Matt's an audio expert, so we're going to be asking him a whole bunch of questions. And if you have any questions, of course, please let us know. And uh, you know, interact, throw your questions in chat. In the meantime, you can always subscribe. If you guys have any suggestions for upcoming shows or any questions, of course, you can leave them in the comment section or send us an email to live at epifan.com. That always helps us out. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, no big updates here in the studio. We're just rolling along as usual. Um, but, you know, for this episode, we have a few extra microphones you might see here on our desk. We've got some different microphones happening. That's because we wanted to talk about sound today. So. Just to start things off, actually, we're going to go over to the laptop here, and I'm going to play two clips. The first clip is uh, is going to be a, a clip with really. We're just rolling along as usual, um, but you know, for this episode, we have a few extra microphones you might see here on our desk. We've got some different microphones value. happening. That's because we wanted to so talk about school. sound today. <laughs> so <laughs> just to start things off, actually, we're going to go over to the laptop. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to play two impressed. clips. Yeah. The first um, clip is, so this is, a, yeah, higher production is going to be can stand uh, out from a clip with most really, of YouTube, sorry, most of, uh, Facebook but we're just rolling along as usual. Um, but and a lot of times you know, for this okay. episode, we but have a few extra use, microphones uh, you might see like here on our desk. We've got some different microphones value. happening. That's because we You're wanted to talk about our sound today. So there you see, we just wanted to demonstrate. That was a clip that had like really great picture quality but really bad audio quality. And, you know, we often say when it comes to professional looking video, nothing, uh, nothing indicates low quality or amateur quicker than poor quality audio. I don't know, you were telling me a little bit about, you know, the suspension of disbelief and how important good quality audio is. Right, so I'm not gonna jump too much into the whole suspension of disbelief, but essentially without audio, uh, I mean, unless you're, you're, you're deaf or along those lines, um, it's hard to really immerse yourself into a movie when you have no audio. For example, if you're watching a horror movie, sound really sets the mood. It sets the tone, sets the pace. If you're ever scared in a horror movie, put it on mute. Suddenly, not very terrifying. So, I mean, like, having good audio that's in sync with your video and that also is well calibrated while, you know, not shooting distortion or any other things is going to really up your game. So, if you've got a choice between, you know, spending $1,000 on video equipment or spending $300 on the audio, I'd go with the audio first. Definitely. So, you know, we know that many people are streaming simply using their cell phones or maybe they have a camera with like a built-in microphone. So what are the disadvantages to using this kind of an audio setup and, you know, maybe why would someone want to upgrade over this type of an audio solution? Well, cool. I mean, it makes sense. A lot of people who are live streaming right now are typically using like their cell phones or they're using like an iPad or some sort of tablet which is great for, for portability and, and whatnot. Now, the, the pitfall to that is the microphones that are built into these, these tablets or, or these cell phones often don't have the greatest audio codecs. They won't have the greatest filters. So a lot of the times you'll get a lot, if you're, especially if you're outside, you get a lot of wind noise if it's a even remotely windy day. Um, if your hand is touching the device or it scrapes along the microphone at any point in time, that's also gonna cause you an audio issue as well. If you put your thumb over it, obviously it'll muffle the sound, so on and so forth. So, introducing a different choice of audio, whether it's for a professional microphone or a, a shotgun microphone that's installed on a camera, will greatly improve that audio quality because it'll give you better reliability. So you can put a filter, such as you'll find on, on most cameras, right? So those these filters here will essentially prevent noise and different hisses and, and, and essentially just weird distortion and noise that you don't really need in your sig in your in stream or signal in, in general. Um, you'll see things like, especially in recording studios with uh, with musicians and such, so they'll have microphones with, with what's called a pop filter on the front. This greatly reduces the, the, the I guess it's actually the pop of a P sound and reduce the, 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 the high end shrill or annoyance of an S sound. So S and P are the biggest problems when it comes to any sort of audio recording or streaming. And you know, from many of the live streams that I've been watching on Facebook and YouTube that are done with a cell phone, one of the other things that I notice very quickly is you hear some echo in the room, you hear the fan in the Absolutely. corner, you hear all kinds of different things that you don't want to hear. So yes. why is that happening? So that's happening just because a lot of the times we'll have to really put a lot of emphasis on, on input gain for the audio. In order to be able to hear properly, they'll have to actually maximize their aim. Especially on mobile devices, they're designed to pick up as much audio as humanly possible, even in a loud space. Sure, they have 
you know, software that'll try and minimize background noise, but that'll never be the case when you're opening up just a camera for video. It's trying to capture as much audio as, as a far distance away as humanly possible. Whereas a microphone, you can control that gain. You control how much volume or, or power you're putting into that device. So you can have way better control of the dynamics and over the, the space that you have, reducing essentially what's called your noise floor. Okay, so noise, there's a lot of different terms. No, no, I've heard you mention noise floor, and we've talked about different types of amplified signals. There's a lot to learn with audio. Yes. But for someone who just wants to, you know, get the basics down, what are some of the easiest ways to sort of upgrade, take the next step above, you know, an internal camera microphone or a cell phone microphone? Where's a good place to start? Okay, so for, for those of you that are trying to find the best place to start, the best place to start is first to know what your setup is going to be. What's your show primarily going to do? Is it going to be something like here where you're sitting in a studio where you have more control over your environment? Or are you going to be mobile? Are you going to be outside, moving around? Are you going to be around cars? This will greatly impact what sort of audio features and audio devices you want to use, especially for recording and capture. So if you're in a studio you may and you have control over your space and you want to be able to capture multiple people, but you may only have one audio source available, you can use uh, an omnidirectional microphone or you can use, um, so essentially that it involves being able to capture from any direction around that microphone. So omnidirectional means that it doesn't really matter where the sound is in relation to the microphone necessarily. Correct. Um, then you have cardioids or, or directional microphones, which are the this most... This is a cardioid, right? Correct. The most standard ones. Like typically singers will have them where you essentially have to point the microphone directly at the audio source you want to capture. Um, there are other patterns such as figure eights or polar patterns where you can capture a lot from the front, a lot from the back, but nothing from the sides. Um, typically you see that with uh, omnidirectional microphones as well. Sometimes they'll give you an option to flip what kind of polar pattern you want to use. Um, and then for if you're doing a higher production quality or you're trying to do audio capture recording for, let's say, sound effects, uh, depending on your source, you may want to use something like a, um, like a T setup where you have a bi-directional microphone that captures left and right. Uh, and one that captures from the front. I see this a lot used with uh, trying to capture cars, planes, anything involved. So if you're like at a racetrack or something, great to have because you'll be able to get the proper left to right pan for your video source you're watching. So if you're doing NASCAR or any sort of racing, um, you know, motorcycle races, if you're doing Isle of Man as an example, same thing. So basically, if you know what kind of setup you're going to have, what kind of reliability you're going to need, it's going to greatly impact. If you need to capture audio from super far away, but you want a little bit more control over it, you might want to get something like a shotgun mic. Now, this is sort of a small shotgun mic, right? Yes. So usually when I s have seen a shotgun mic, they're usually long and pointy, and they're sort of very directional from what I understand. Yeah. So they're, with shotgun mics, you have a couple different what's known as, as essentially as patterns for capture. There's cardioid, which is a standard like SM58 or a standard you know voice mic. Uh, you have a super cardioid, which means it has a more narrow focus on what it will capture before it starts kind of ignoring everything else on the outside. And you have a hyper cardioid, which you'll typically see if you guys ever go to an arena for like a hockey game or something, you'll see them hanging from the ceiling. That means that it'll only capture what's directly in that straight line of fire. Um, so those will also greatly impact your, your availability. Now, if we're going to get into the big scheme of things. Condenser microphones will always give you better quality because they are self powered most of the time or they power over 48 volts um, which also gives you a little bit more control over what's called your noise floor so the amount of noise that's in a room you can make sure that you have a signal that's strong enough to eliminate I guess the amount of noise that background noise that might be coming into play you know and sometimes it's actually surprising how much noise there is in a room yes. you know we've got you know s some fans in this room which we've disabled because mm -hmm. we have prepared this as a studio but Oftentimes, you may have a computer running in the background, yep. which has a fan. You may have another device, even um, you know the slight city hum of having a window open if you're in an urban area can yep. actually be quite a bit of noise floor. Well, one of the biggest things that a lot of people tend to forget when they're trying to take into consideration noise in a room is flat, hard surfaces. So like this desk is a prime surface for reflections that will cause extra noise if, if things are moving around. Uh, any blank space for a wall, windows, doors, that kind of thing will hugely impact. So um, the what we have behind us, I guess, in, in this shot is an anechoic chamber. It's essentially designed to absorb as much sound as humanly possible. I did talk about this a little bit more briefly in one of our very first um, Epifan Live shows, but essentially 
it's so quiet in that room, you can actually hear every single bodily function that your body is doing. You can hear the blood moving through your body. You can hear your heartbeat in your ears like you were beside an actual open heart. Like that, it's, That's amazing. And that's simply because once you quiet all of that noise floor, if you will, that background yep. white noise, um, it's actually surprising what you can hear when that's gone. It's terrifying. A lot of I think the longest person who's ever stayed in an echo chamber was about forty odd minutes before they started going crazy. Um, and I don't use this term lightly. People actually start to go insane because they think something is seriously wrong with them. But besides the point, that's saying if, as long as you have control over your environment um, as much as possible, you'll be able to get better quality of sound. So we've talked about a number of different microphones and pickup patterns, and we have a few different microphones here in the studio today. So I thought yes. maybe we could kind of just, for, for everyone watching, uh, go through some of these microphones and actually test them and give you all a chance to hear the difference. Um, we do have a question coming in from Facebook now, which we'll answer. Um, is audio into an Epiphan switcher at line or mic level, mono or stereo? So, so the thing is, if we're talking about Epiphan switcher, we're, we're probably talking about Pearl in this case. Um, yeah. So Pearl, here in the studio, we're using Pearl 2. Yes. For so, our audio. So with Pearl 2 and Pearl, they're all line level signals that need to be introduced into our, our unit or our device. Now, there is obviously a, a significant difference between mic level and line level. But uh, essentially, a microphone on its own does not have enough power or energy to be able to push that sound out at an audible level. We need what's called a preamp, uh, so a, or a preamplification method or unit or box. Most commonly used is um, like a mixing board, like a live mixing board you see in a studio or at a live show. They have built-in preamps that will help boost that signal. You have what's called gain to uh, basically artificially crank that, that sound or that, that volume in order to be able to actually hear it at an audible level. Um, so like I know this microphone, if I plug this into a camera that has an XLR, an XLR port and that camera does not have phantom power or 48 volt power, you can't hear anything out of this microphone. Well, it's, this is what's known as a dynamic microphone. Um, so 48 volts wouldn't affect it either way. So 48 volts is specifically geared towards, uh, well, essentially let's, let's talk about these ones and the, micro, and the microphone that we're actually using up, up above us at the moment. So these ones require phantom power. A lot of them are, are what's called active condensers. They actually usually include like a AAA battery. Um, essentially what this does is they require more power for use, but they give you more volume or more sound um, with a smaller noise floor. So essentially, if you have an option of buying either like a standard condenser microphone, or sorry, dynamic microphone versus a condenser microphone, the condenser, in my personal opinion, will always have better quality and, and better control than a dynamic microphone. Now, there is a significant difference in price as well. Where you pick up a dynamic microphone or the most standard ones, which is like a Shure SM58 or SM57 microphone, which you'll pick up for about $100 to $200 if it's an American-made one. Um, in order to get something of, uh, of a large condenser microphone similar to this Audio-Technica here, you're going to be paying significantly more, somewhere between four to two thousand dollars depending on on the brand that you're going with but that aside um preamps you can either buy a specific box for preamp uh, uh, which of course you can get anywhere from a consumer grade preamp to a professional grade preamp the cost is rather significant uh we're talking hundreds versus thousands upon tens of thousands of dollars but again that's if you're going into the pro recording industry that kind of thing but you can certainly get away with buying like a like a 200 dollar mixer such as something from Mackie or Behringer, which is the more consumer grade ones. So essentially from that point, you go out from the board and into Pearl 2, and that will give you a line level signal because the signal is now loud enough to be able to be supported. Okay. So, I mean, Pearl has a lot of uh, audio uh, configuration options. So do you need a line level signal to use Pearl, or can you use an, uh, a mic level signal as well? Unfortunately, with Pearl and Pearl 2, it is simply line level signals line level. that are supported. Um, we just, I guess, don't have the preamps that are, that are built into it to support, you know, being able to just connect straight mm -hmm. a microphone in. And now, if you're go. coming out of an HDMI camera, of course, mm -hmm. then you're getting your audio over HDMI, which is what we're doing here in the studio. Yes, so you're already coming out at a line level. 
Okay. Um, now, that being said, if you've got a camera that's a little bit more professional prosumer that has an XLR input, a lot of those cameras already have 40 volts and phantom power and the ability to control gain on a microphone. So anything exiting that camera is already going to be line level, regardless. Okay. As long as you can set your audio settings on the camera, you're good to go. Excellent. So sort of a long-winded answer to that question, but uh, I mean, there's uh, we, we do have a, a number of microphones here in the studio, so maybe we could kind of test a few of these out and, uh, and talk about them a little bit. So right now, you're hearing us on our studio shotgun mic. So why don't we go to our side camera, actually, uh, for just a moment so that we can give everyone a, a sort of a peek of our setup here. Yeah, so the this camera, or sorry, this this microphone that we're using typically, is this one up here, um, it we has like a little handmade sock on it which essentially acts as a filter so it keeps any sort of uh, wind noise or anything else that might be coming into play um, out of the way. But this is what's called a shotgun mic, or it's a small condenser microphone. Now the benefits to a shotgun mic versus something like our standard large diaphragm um, microphone such as, or condenser microphone such as this one, is a shotgun mic tends to pick up further distances away in a more narrow field of audio. So if you need to capture someone at the other end of a room, and uh, you have a choice between using a shotgun microphone or using a large condenser um, microphone, I would always recommend using the shotgun because it has you have more control because there's a more direct path on what you're trying to capture. Okay, so you gotta really make sure that you, when you're using a shotgun mic, you have it pointed Correctly, right? Correct. And you will still pick up noise around the area because in this case, ours is not a hypercardioid. Uh, this one is a supercardioid, if I, if I do recall correctly. It's a Sennheiser, which uh, if you're not paying in the, in the two to $3,000 range, you're typically going to get a supercardioid. So this is maybe a little less focused, a little broader of a pickup pattern. Yes. That's why you're able to hear. So we sort of just have it aimed, as you can see, sort of right between our shoulders. Yeah. So and, it, and you can hear both of us, no problem. Right. Now, so let's talk about the difference in sound. Now, between a, a small, small, or small, small diaphragm versus a large diaphragm, you're going to hear some significant differences between the two because depending on your setup, you're going to have different audio properties. So if we were to switch over to this large condenser, large diaphragm condenser microphone, you'll start to notice a lot more bass and warmth to that voice that you won't necessarily have with that shotgun microphone. Let's, uh, let's pull this one in and, and give people a chance to hear what it sounds like. I mean... I'm a little bit further away than you. Maybe there's right. some difference there. Of course, there's going to be some different audio um, levels between you and I, obviously, because the microphone is pretty well in front of me uh, versus you're a little bit further away. However, if I was to stand on the other side of this microphone and start talking, you would still hear me at the exact same level. This is an omnidirectional microphone's, I guess, perks. So, I mean, that's great if you're trying to, perhaps, you had several people sitting around a table. Yep and everyone's sort of a different position relative to where the microphone is. Whereas, you know, with something like a shotgun, um, that's maybe not as ideal in a situation where perhaps you have several people sitting around a table or different sitting across from one another. Of course. Um, and, and one of the things you'll most commonly see is if you're ever watching the, the, late, the late show or a late night TV show, whether it's uh, Jimmy Fallon or if you're watching Larry King or any, you always see... Um, they have a, a, a desk microphone, essentially. It's an omnidirectional or bi-directional microphone that allows you to hear the host and whomever is directly beside, I guess, beside them, really. It's, so the omnidirectional microphone allows you to be able to carry multiple, I guess, a full conversation with multiple people in a very short space. Why don't we, uh, just for a moment, just go to picture in picture. I was going to show um, a very popular microphone that I've seen a lot used as a desk mic, and this is the, the Blue Yeti. So I know this is quite popular because you can plug it in with just a USB. Yes. Um, so you don't need a preamp the, necessarily. Is that right? Yeah. So if you're in a more like con consumer conscious or if your budget's a little bit tighter, USB microphone is never a bad way to go. Um, if you if you're if you're really tight on constraints and you can't afford something at a, at a higher quality, or you don't have hundreds or thousands of dollars to invest in audio, USB is a great way is a great place to start. You know, if you're just trying to do a, a talk conversation or you're trying to do some, some gaming or anything else you're trying to do and just trying to capture all that extra audio, by all means, the USB or the, the, the Yeti microphone is a really good place to start. Okay, great. So why don't we talk about, we have some still have some other mics here, so why don't we give this a try? Let's switch over to this cardioid and see what it sounds like. So this is actually a mic that uh, was used, I believe, for uh, 
recording streeter style interviews. Um, so attached to the camera, man on the street, interviews with lots of traffic, lots of noise nearby. So from what I understand, this microphone is pretty good at isolating the area directly in front of the mic and not picking up a lot of the other noise. But uh, I don't know what, what, obviously I'm gonna have to hand this to you now so that we can hear your response. So, so the biggest thing with a, with a cardio microphone or a directional microphone is you need to make sure that, of course, the sound and, and the, I guess the, the head of the microphone is facing the source you want to capture. If I was to start talking and starting to angle the microphone away from me, you'll suddenly learn and seem to hear a difference. Suddenly my, my, my voice is getting more muffled. You're starting to hear a lot less. You're hearing a lot of what's going on on the other side of the room now if there is enough noise. That being said, so... Um, having a directional microphone does give you its advantages. So as you were mentioning, if you are you know, a news anchor or anything else, the, the key point is you want to keep it close to you as much as possible, but also be in control of your voice. You'll notice a lot of singers on stage, if they start singing or if they have to yell or do something more powerful, they'll move the microphone further away from their mouth or they'll take it close to them if they're going to do something a little bit quieter, like a whisper or anything along that lines. So directional is hugely important. Now, rule of thumb, if you're going to use a directional microphone such as this, I'd recommend typically having it at about yeah, like mid-chest height, probably about two to four inches away from your body and angled in just slightly to yourself to get... A, the best audio sound you're going to get for yourself. It's going to prevent you get, uh, any exhale from your mouth or your nose is not going to get captured into the microphone as well. And, you know, you just kind of generally reduce any sort of noise in front of you or around you. So um, let's try it with something a little bit different. You're wearing what's called a lavalier mic. Or yeah, it might be hard to see because I've got a camouflage shirt on here, but I am wearing a lav. So why don't we switch over to that? Okay, and now I believe we have our, our lav audio. So... If this is working correctly, you should be hearing me through the lav now. Now, I've used lavs quite a bit in video production, and I mean, they're great microphones because they typically sound very good for someone's voice. Um, they don't pick up a lot of sound floor, if you will, typically, but there are some disadvantages to them as well. I mean, for one, I, I'm wearing this and you're not, so. Right, so you're going to have a harder time hearing me, and so I have to raise my voice in order to be captured by that microphone. Exactly. And another thing I often see is like people who are moving around a lot, sometimes if someone touches, I'll try not to ruin everyone's ears here, but you know, the old uh, rough rustling, sh rustling clothing or wind or other things tend to pick up quite dramatically on, on a lavalier microphone because it is a, a, a microphone that's going to be touching the person who is using it. Right. So if you want to just head back over to our, our, our standard shotgun overhead here. Perfect. So um, that being said, yeah, there, there is some added benefits to having a lavalier mic as well. Um, a lot of times you'll often wonder that if, if one of us has to change directions, you know, if we're, if we're looking at something behind us or we need to bend over to, to reach something at the end of the desk, suddenly that voice might not be as clear to hear with a stationary shotgun mic or something like we do in the studio. Whereas a lavalier mic, you could get up and walk to the other end of the room. I'm still going to hear you the same. Well, yeah, that's just it. And I think we've experienced this a little bit in the studio, but if sometimes we've been doing some more mobile active demonstrations of cameras or lights and you turn away from the microphone and suddenly our shotgun is no longer picking up the voice just because yep. of the how directional it is so in that in a situation like that wearing a lavalier could be great now we're using um, like a Sennheiser professional quality wireless lav but you can also get lavalier microphones that actually just are wired and plugged yep. directly into the camera yeah and depending on how far your setup is it's actually a great way to go like if you're stationary at a desk um, that's pretty close to your camera source so I don't see why you shouldn't be able to use that now, if you're using a stationary setup, one of the things we can talk about, this this kind of this little box here has been sitting on the desk the whole time, quietly making its its presence known. Its presence known, I guess <laughs> we'll go with that. This is a nice looking box. What um, is it though? This is called essentially it's a sound card. So sound card is what you can typically use to connect to a, a computer. Um, I use one at home because I'm an audiophile. Um, and but essentially this connects over USB. A lot of the new ones are obviously going to be connected over USB three because that's the way the technology is going. And eventually USB C. But essentially, this acts as its own sound card. So it's own little built-in preamp. Now, this is an M-Audio box. Um, there's M-Audio, like some of the older generations, they had the Fast Track, the Fast Track Ultra, they had the standard ones. So you can get some as little as one input, two inputs, four inputs, and so on and so forth. Now, the fun thing with these is you can have it set up. So if you want to upgrade and use like stereo-style 
speakers. You can connect them in the back. Some of them have XLR outputs, which is often really cool. Uh, on the front, you'll see these. These are the most standard ports. Now, it's a little bit hard to see probably from, uh, from the camera over there, but essentially it's an XLR input. But the added benefit is there's actually a hole in the middle, so it allows you to connect a quarter inch um, or a standard, you know, let's call it a patch cord for, for a like instrument. On your, with, like with your electric guitar, the patch, the patch exactly. cable, right? So this sound card allows you to capture that audio, whether it's from a microphone or from a, a, an instrument of sorts. So with something like this, you know, I could use one of these inputs for my microphone, and mm -hmm. then let's say I was doing a live stream where maybe I'm playing an instrument yep. or doing something else, I can have my instrument on another channel and adjust that volume independently. Correct. So these knobs here would be for your gain, so controlling what kind of loudness and volume you need for the, the microphone itself to be loud enough to be heard. And then of course you've got headphones uh, where you can control your independent volume there, overall volume for your speakers as well. Now the added fun thing too is this one here has it and most sound cards will. They'll have a 48 volt power which will allow you the ability to use a condenser microphone as well. So these are really cool and really handy to have. If you've got um, a little bit of extra cash, you can invest into a stationary setup for audio. I usually recommend getting a sound card. Typically, they'll range you anywhere between, I would say about $200 and $400 for a, a, a consumer or prosumer level uh, sound card, but this will greatly impact your audio quality over time. So what, what kind of budget would we be looking at for something like this? So just that, so that that original M Audio M track was probably at the time about one hundred and ninety eight to two hundred dollars um, plus tax. So if you're living in Canada, probably about two hundred and thirty. If you're living in the U.S., it probably would have been probably closer to about two fifteen. Yeah. So, so I mean, relatively speaking, uh, you know, to, to 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 take your audio to a professional level isn't as expensive as perhaps you know we see how much cameras cost uh, easily yes. easily into the thousands, whereas you know, considering how important audio is and how vital it is to increasing the quality of your production value, the expenditure to take your audio to the next level is really not, it's not so bad. Nope. And, mic and the best thing about microphones too is, unless they've been dropped or like really poorly handled, they have great resale values. If you're jumping on to eBay or Amazon or Kijiji and looking at used items, 99% of the time they're in phenomenal shape. And anyone who says, no, you can't test it before you purchase it, chances are they probably dropped it and you probably walk away from it anyways. So we do have a question coming in from, uh, from chat. And someone was wondering about, you know, sort of the difference between a field mixer and a prosumer stereo mixer. So here in the studio, we have a multi-channel mixer, which is how we were able to switch between all the microphones right. that we were just listening to. Um, but in terms of mixers, what is a field mixer? What is a stereo mixer? Why would someone choose one over the other? Well, I think that would actually probably be a good topic on its own to discuss. I would actually recommend that we do this for a future episode. And by all means, guys, if you guys have any specific questions about mixers or any audio that I've covered today or that we've covered today, by all means, let us know and let's let's cover that in a future topic. Because I'd love to spend more time just talking about audio and you know maybe write some blog posts for you guys as well. Um, but there is there is a little bit of a difference in what you're able to do between something that's portable, such as a field mixer, and something that's more stationary as a prosumer or consumer grade um, a mixer. That being said, though, depending on your entire setup, it may not be necessary, right? So the knowing what you need for a setup first is what's most importantly going to impact your budget as well as your quality for your overall live stream or even recordings. So. For many people, let's say you're using a, like a handy cam, like something that's yeah. a smaller camera, and that's what you're using to live stream. Um, wh where where would someone start? I mean, a lot of smaller cameras don't have, uh, you know, professional XLR audio ports, right? Right, but you'll notice on on this little shotgun mic here, this Rode microphone, it's got a 3.5 millimeter input. Yeah, I mean that just that's your standard 3.5 that looks like a headphone. Yeah, essentially, jack, yeah. Right? Now the thing is now most cameras. Even cheaper cameras have one of these inputs, right? Which, which is exactly the point, right? So if you have the ability to use a camcorder and buy a little 3.5 millimeter, you know, microphone, those ones tend to be a little bit more uh, inexpensive. Not that they're cheap in any way, shape, or form. They're just a little bit more easily accessible in terms of pricing. Um, and even just a simple upgrade in, in a small microphone like that, which could be as cheap as 20 to 40 dollars, depending on how how inexpensive you're willing to go. Um, you can greatly improve just that by having less wind noise because you've got like a filter on top of it. 
uh, and able to just get a better direction out of it all of it. You're not capturing all the wind noise from the trees or the passing cars. Another thing I noticed, and I actually got this microphone for my DSLR because I do a lot of shooting on my DSLR. Um, one thing I noticed with the internal microphone on my DSLR and on many cameras, because the microphone is inside the camera, I'm hearing what the autofocus is doing. I'm hearing the little power buzz when I flip, like the power. I can actually yep. hear the electricity in my camera, it sounds like. Just getting my audio out of the camera and onto the top of the camera made a big difference. I Absolutely. Found. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is you're speaking about DSLR. DSLR cameras, you have to know if you're going to be doing live stream with a DSLR to know if it actually outputs live audio. Now, this is a question we get a lot, especially with some of our other devices. So it's important that you are able to verify first that your camera can do live audio. So one of the best ways to do that is if you're going outputs, typically HDMI from your camera, plug that into a television and just see if you're able to hear something when it's on standby. A lot of DSLR cameras, unfortunately, don't do live audio. They only do what's known as audio through basically recorded playback. playback. So you can only hear audio out of your HDMI when you're playing a clip that you've already recorded. Exactly. Yeah. So keep that in mind, guys. If you guys are looking to use a camera you already have, like let's say a Canon Rebel T5i, um, which is a common one that a lot of people have, that unfortunately does not output live audio. So make sure you're running that test first before you get all gung-ho into live streaming. Because it might mean mm, I need to have a separate audio source I'm somehow bringing into this setup, or I need to look at a different camera. Which actually brings up a great point. So for next week, our topic for the show, we're going to be talking about an HDMI audio inserter. So that actually allows you to take external audio sources and overlay them on an HDMI audio source. So cool. we'll, we'll get into that a bit more next week. Stay tuned for our show next week if that's interesting to you. Um, but I think we've covered quite a bit here today. So is there is there any other sort of just general advice that you would give to someone who wants to take their audio up a notch? Where you know What would be the, the, the key takeaway? Um, Take your time and do your research first and foremost. Just because something looks like it might be inexpensive and you might consider it cheap doesn't mean that it is. Obviously know what kind of setup you're going to use. If you're going to be outside a lot, make sure you have some sort of directional microphone that you can use with a filter. Uh, if you're going to be in a studio and you're going to be interviewing people, make sure you have something that's going to best benefit an entire room. Make sure you're keeping in mind of what sort of noise you might be introducing or that might be around in the area. That will greatly improve just being conscious of that, even if you don't have access to the funds to upgrade any audio setup, just being conscious of that can all often help in increasing the quality of your live streams and your recordings. Now, Excellent. let's talk about one really cool thing. We're talking about live streams, and sometimes people are like, well, I don't know what to live stream, what am I going to do? we got some really cool stuff that's happening that I don't think has actually happened since, what was it, the 70s? The 70s, yeah, actually. We wanted to touch on this news item just briefly uh, because it's, it is a timely news topic. So um, why don't we go over to the picture in picture and I'll share this page. Um, coming up on August 21st, there's actually a solar eclipse happening. And this hasn't happened, I don't think, in North America since the 90s. And even then, it wasn't a full solar eclipse. But if you are in middle America, you're going to have a great opportunity to see the solar eclipse happening on uh, August 21st. And actually, if you see here, there's a number of uh, outlets that are going to be live streaming it. So NASA will have a live stream, the Weather Channel will have a live stream, CNN, even Volvo, a number of other outlets are going to be live streaming this. My question is, if you are in middle America, live stream, um, you don't have to necessarily have a lot of equipment. You know, if you have a camera and you can point it out a window, it's going to become night in the middle of day. Uh, which is going to be pretty cool, and this yep. isn't something that happens very often. Uh, the last major solar eclipse, I think, was oh back in the 70s. So this is uh, this is really cool. There's going to be uh, you can kind of see it here on the video, the pattern. But basically, the the eclipse will start in the northwest United States, and it will cross uh, down towards like from kind of like up by Oregon down to Florida. So if you're in the middle of the U.S., you're going to have a great opportunity to see this, and actually. Uh, we're here in the Ottawa office in Canada. We're going to get to see it, but I think it'll only be a 70 or 80 percent eclipse. But if you're on this direct path that you see here, you're going to have a great opportunity to really uh, capture a, a, a rare celestial event. So um, just putting it out there, if you guys are thinking of maybe trying a live stream that 
could get a lot of uh, interest, maybe this would be a good opportunity for you. So uh, let us know, see if, uh, if it's interesting to you. Maybe we can help you figure out how to get your live stream up and running. So we're going to have lots of uh, advice regarding this coming up in our episode next week as well. Um, we might try to get something going ourselves and yeah, let us know what you think. If uh, this is interesting and if you're going to live stream, how are you going to do it? Um, and let us know because maybe we can help. Now, live at EpiFan.com for any questions, comments, suggestions for a show in the future. Uh, leave a comment, subscribe to our Facebook and YouTube page. That's always a great help. Now, one more key point for that solar eclipse. Important to note, please do your research. Do not stare directly at the eclipse. You will go blind. Yeah, you can actually get eclipse glasses. Lots of places are selling them. Pop onto Amazon, find your eclipse sunglasses so that'll protect your eyes when it's happening. But uh, very exciting. We're looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this episode. So thanks so much for joining us here in the Epifan studio. We look forward to seeing you at the same time next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And until then, I'm Dan. I'm Matt. So long.